So you can't really get by with turning on the TV these days and not hearing about the coronavirus, can you? I know some of you probably saw the release that I put out, but I just want to say for everyone to hear that, uh, just a few thoughts, that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have such a great opportunity to show what it is to be anchored in truth, to be anchored to Christ, to not be in fear, to have joy and to be wise, right? You know, we want to be smart about it. We want to also recognize the fact that there are people who are going to be adversely affected. And of course, we want to do what we can to protect them. And at the same time, we don't want to live in great fear, but we want to be smart. So the elders and myself, we are going to just keep a watch on things, we'll monitor the situation, and uh, we want to be good, wise stewards, right? So we will uh, let you know if anything comes up. So yes, be practical. Wash your hands often. You know, Second Timothy one seven. I just put Timothy there, but Second Timothy one seven. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power, of love, and sound judgment. And that's what we want to go forward in. We can offer comfort. We can offer hope. It's a good opportunity for us. So don't let fear rob you. And I just want to say that today in our study, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 9. And I really think that as we look at some of this stuff, and I know as, as I read Daniel 9, you might be thinking, how on earth does this bring us hope? But I'm going to show you some things today that I think are really exciting about how awesome our God is. A God who is not wondering what to do about a coronavirus. He is not, he's not worried. It doesn't thwart his plans. He knew about it long before we did. In our study today, there's going to be a reality that we are under the care of God. And God knows. And as I've been saying week after week now, God's got this. God is sovereign. And I think there's some real hope and encouragement in the passage that we are going to work through today in Daniel chapter 9. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit of God, in the name of Jesus, and by the power of the blood that was shed for us on that cross, I pray that you will bring to us great joy in your word. Father, that you would get us excited about what you are doing what you have done in the past, what you are planning to do in the future, the promises that you give to us, that we can rely on you, we can trust in you. God, help us to go to your word to know how to be wise and caring and tender, to help those who are in need, to look out for those who cannot care for themselves. And Lord Jesus, I pray that the word of God would just jump out at us today and, and speak to our hearts, deep into our soul. Pierce us with your word, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, so here's how we're going to start today. There is a train leaving Pipestone at 11 a.m., traveling 45 miles per hour, heading south to Kansas City. At the same time, a train is leaving Kansas City, heading north to Pipestone, traveling 50 miles per hour. The starting distance between the trains is 400 miles. There is a track bypass 70 miles, 75 miles south of Pipestone, 125 miles south of Pipestone, 215 miles south of Pipestone, 310 miles south of Pipestone. To be, the most efficient, to be most efficient with time and in order to prevent an accident, which I see I'm a not as good at English here either. Uh, at least in mine I say and, but an accident. Which train should pull off to wait and which bypass should they pull off on? How many of you love story problems? I wanna see. You are sick, people. <laughs> oh my, my goodness, what's wrong with you? Most, well, that's true, right? 
Most of us couldn't wait to get out of school to be done with story problems like this. We look forward to getting out of that. Can I just ask the rest of you, what difference would it make if you were on the train and people were coming to you asking to help figure out when to pull off? Would that make a difference? Then you'd all be calling up Micah and Maya going, hey, can you help us out with this story problem? Right? It makes a difference. What does this all have to do with chapter 9 of Daniel? I got to be up front with you. This passage can feel a little bit like working through a story problem. I want to be honest with you on that. However, I got to tell you, this is a train that we're all going to be on. Whether we live out our lives and we see this day or we leave this body behind and our souls live on, which they will, we will all see a day that is coming that is promised in the future that Daniel 9 speaks of. But a lot of what we're going to see today is going to be setting up to see how trustworthy God is in his knowledge and his foreknowledge and his willingness to share with us some things that we ought to know so we can know that he's there. Whether or not we believe the scriptures, there is a day coming that we will all face what is going to be talked about. So while it might seem a little bit like trudging through some of these numbers, there's a huge blessing in this. And in fact, I think it can give us a lot of hope, a lot of faith in knowing God's got it, as we're reminded of the second coming of Christ. Now, most of us on occasion are asked, why do you even believe in that book that was written 2,000 years ago. It's not even relevant anymore, is it? Question mark. It's really helpful to know a passage like Daniel 9. So you can say, you know, can I just show you something? I want to show you something in Daniel 9. And you can walk them through what I'm going to walk you through here in just a little bit. There is an undeniable prophecy and fulfillment that's already taken place in Daniel 9. The only way to account for it is a power that knows the future. And this is no medium, this is no uh, palm reader, this is no psychic. The only one who can know with all accuracy and truly knows what's to come is God himself. And he shares some things with us. Did you know that there is an exact prophecy that tells when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was going to come? Around Christmas time, we often talk about the prophecies which say, here's where he's going to be born. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be born of a virgin. Right? We read those things. We're, we're gonna, we read things in the Old Testament prophecy that he's going to come up out of Egypt, that he's going to be a, a Nazarene, but he's going to be from, from uh, Galilee, and, and all these things. Just It's like, well, how does that work until you see it in the life of Christ? But today, as we look at Daniel 9, there's some really incredible things that stand out that uh, I, I think details like this are just a, a great confirmation of the providence of God. And so I get to show you that today. So I'm a little excited about it. Maybe I'm a little nerdy about it. But hey, God's got this and it's good stuff. So let's just begin with the context of Daniel. The context of Daniel, where we are at, last week we were reading about this prayer that Daniel was praying. He had just, we had just read some different prophecies. Now he prays to God. 
And Daniel had been reading the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 25. And in Jeremiah 25, it tells how, uh, how Israel is going to be in captivity and they're going to be dispersed. And Jeremiah says it's going to be for 70 years. And Daniel is one of these people from Israel, from Jerusalem, that has been captive in Babylon. Yes, he's got a good relationship there in Babylon. Yes, people have a lot of respect for him. Yes, he has risen up to the position of a great leader. But he's looking at Jeremiah, and Daniel is now somewhere in the area of between 80 and 90 years old. Somewhere in there. He's been here for maybe 65 plus years in Babylon. And he says, okay, God, the 70 years are just about up. And then what he begins to do is he begins to confess because he recognizes the fact that even though Israel, even though it, it's been said we would be here and God was going to use this as a time to discipline us, we are still rebelling against God. So he calls out, God, would you please, would you act? Not on the fact that we have figured it all out and that we're, we got it all together and we no longer sin and we're all being surrendered to you, but God, would you act on the basis that you are a compassionate God full of grace? That's where we begin in this context as we read from Daniel chapter 9. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and one of our ushers will get a Bible for you. Daniel chapter 9, 20 to 27. So please follow along with me. Daniel speaking. He says, while I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my petition before Yahweh my God, concerning the holy mountain of my God, while I was praying, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the first vision, came to me. Now we know Gabriel's an angel. We also should point out here, this isn't a vision that Daniel is having. This isn't a dream that Daniel's having, like some of the other prophecies that we saw in the past. This is an angel coming to Daniel and speaking to him what God has as a message. He is a messenger. Gabriel, by the way, is also going to be the angel that we see who comes to Mary and Joseph. I think that might be a little significant. So it says, the man I had seen in the first vision came to me in my extreme weariness. So he's, he's praying, he's weary, says about the time of the evening offering. He gave me this explanation. Daniel, I've come now to give you understanding. At the beginning of your petitions, at the beginning of, of when you were praying and asking, an answer went out and I've come to give it. You are treasured for you are treasured by God. So con consider the message and understand the vision. So here comes the story problem. Do your best to follow along. Really encourage you to have your Bibles open reading this because if you're just listening to me, you're going to get lost because you're probably going to get lost while, I, while you're trying to follow along. So if you got your Bible, Daniel 9, verse 24. So here's what the angel says. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy, holy city. Remember, Daniel said, how long is this going to go on? Are, are, we're rebelling. Would you act? Angel comes, says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end. Listen to what's going to happen. To put a stop to sin. To wipe away iniquity. To bring in everlasting Righteousness. Now, I know most of you can't help but be thinking about Jesus already, right? It's kind of what happened out with the cross, wasn't it? This is what Jesus did. But just put that aside for the moment. To bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. 
from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, which equals, math people, 69 weeks, right? It will be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat, but in the difficult times. After those 62 weeks, so after the seven weeks and the 62 weeks, so after the 69 weeks, after that, it says, the Messiah will be cut off. Now the Hebrew word there indicates death. It indicates being put to death. The Messiah will be cut off, will be killed, and will have nothing. The people of the coming prince, now we're talking about somebody else, not Jesus. This is a different prince. This is an evil prince. The people of the coming prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood. And until the end, there will be war. So just, I want you to take a note in your mind that from the decree to the 69 weeks after that, so that's already happened, then after that, until the end, there's going to be war. Desolations are decreed. And then it says, he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. So that's going to be the 70th week. All right? Now, there are a couple different ways people look at this. Some look at it as being 69 weeks immediately into the 70th week. Many look at it as being 69 weeks, and then there is a, a parenthesis, which is a, a period of time after the 69 weeks. There's going to be war until the end, and then there's going to be a 70th week. A lot, a lot of scholars look at it that way. That's personally the way that I think we look at this that there will be a 70th week, and, and, and the reference to the 70th week of Daniel is one that's discussed and, and, and discussed and discussed and disagreed upon and questioned often. So just be aware of that. It says, but many for one week. But in the middle of the week, which uh, would be, if we're talking about a, a week of days, that would be how many days? Three and a half days, right? I'm going to present to you a little bit here, though, that we're not talking about days, but I'll get to that. He will put a stop to sacrifice and offering, and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. Now, when I was a teenager, I would hear pastors talk about this stuff and they would go to their chart on the wall or they would you know use this was back with chalk and a chalkboard or else i saw it i remember in the old movies at uh, a distant thunder a thief in the night some of you, some of you are old enough to remember those old esch eschatological movies right uh and, and you had this guy that went through this chart and they're talking about these weeks and they all of a sudden they say 69 weeks 400 is 483 years. I'm going, wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm thinking, why are you saying 60, 69 weeks is 483 years? That doesn't even make sense to me. But they just keep moving on, and, and I'm lost. I'm trying to figure it out. I don't quite understand. It didn't make a whole lot of sense, and I think they're really jumping to some conclusions that I don't, I don't even know where they get that, right? So I think it's worth our time to slow down and to look at it and say, what does this mean? How do they come up with those kinds of numbers? Because it seems like an extreme, it seems pretty extreme to say 69 weeks is 483 years. How on earth are you figuring that out? I also want to bring in just something, and this is a little humorous, but uh, Alistair Begg, some of you might know him, he's on the radio, he's got a program called Truth For Life, He's another one of those Scottish pastors. So if you've heard him, you probably will know his voice or you'll think he's Colin Smith, one of the two, because they both have this Scottish accent in how they speak. 
Both are originally from Scotland. Alistair Bay pastored Charlotte Chapel in uh, Scotland, in Edinburgh, Scotland, which I'm so excited because as of this week, Marty and I, Lord willing, if coronavirus doesn't rise, then uh, we got it worked out so that we can also go to Charlotte Chapel in Scotland while we're on break. That was the one church that I really, really wanted to be able to go to. And now that's all opened up for us. So I'm excited about that. Okay, moving on. Alistair's known for his wonderful ability as a scholar, as a biblical expositor of scripture. And this is what Alistair Begg says about this passage. In what follows, I reserve the right to change my mind later this evening. And as often as necessary for the rest of my life until I finally settle the matter. What I am about to now unfold for you will annoy some, disappoint others, confuse many, and perhaps encourage a few. <laughs> he says it a little bit tongue in cheek, but there's some truth to it. The reality is this, is we need to remember these things. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, charity. In all things, Jesus Christ. In other words, there are things that are worth going to battle over. Trying to figure these dates out exactly isn't worth dividing the, the body of Christ. However, we should study, we should talk about it, we can debate about it as long as it's, as long as it's with, with some love and grace. Because the thing is, when we get to, right down to it all, what really matters is that you know Jesus Christ is coming again, and no matter where you stand on these things, that's a part of what scripture tells us. Jesus is going to come again and we need to be faithful. That's the main thrust. To know God is in control. He's sovereign. Jesus has a plan. He's going to return. But now with that, we're going to talk a little about what we're reading here. So we've got the attitude set. Well, it says seven weeks, 62 weeks. And then one week equals 70 weeks, right? Virtually all Bible scholars agree that seven weeks plus a 62 weeks, which equals 69 weeks, that it's already occurred. No matter where they land on the 70th week, all of, the, all of them land on the fact that six, those 69, that, that's finished. That's in the past for us. It wasn't for Daniel, but it is for us. These 69 weeks is what we're going to focus in on today. Now, I was planning on trying to hit the 70th week this week also, but I'm not going to. I'm going to save that for next week. So we're going to focus on the fulfillment of these 69 weeks. But first, let's focus on the point of confusion, the term of weeks. Why do preachers say this is 483 years? Well, there's kind of a simple answer for this. In Hebrew, the word that is translated in your Bible as weeks is this word, Shabua, and it means sevens. So if we were to read this literally, we would read instead, in verse 24, we would read 70 sevens are decreed. And then verse 25, we would read seven sevens and 62 sevens. It doesn't say weeks in Hebrew. The confusing part is in Hebrew, they understood the sevens meaning a week. Like if I said, hey, we have to go to the store and pick up a dozen, you're thinking right away, either you're thinking a dozen rolls or donuts or you're thinking a dozen eggs, right? It's, it's similar to that. And I, I've got to go get a dozen. What makes the difference is the context. Is it a dozen rolls? Is it a dozen eggs? A dozen what? Well, in Hebrew, this said, what has been decreed is 70 sevens. So what's that mean? Well, in Hebrew, sometimes it was understood as seven days. Why is that? Because in creation, God created six days of creation, and then on the seventh day, he rested. That was the Sabbath. 
So there is a seven of, of days, which equals a week. And we still, we still use that today. We have a seven day week, don't we? However, in Hebrew, sometimes seven was seven years. Because in Hebrew, not only did they have one, two, three, four, five, six days and then a Sabbath day, they also had one, two, three, four, five, six years and then a Sabbath year. And every Sabbath year, you would let the, the land rest. You wouldn't plant on the land. Your work was changed every seven years. Life looked very different every seven years. So every single Hebrew knew when the Sabbath year was coming because they knew it was going to be different. So if you said a week, it could be a week of days or it could be a week of years. So then you have to put in a context to find out what is the context of which we are looking. We in America don't think of of a week as being a week of years. That doesn't, that doesn't jive with what we've grown up with and learned. But the Hebrew concept was used interchangeably. And so in the context, look at Daniel 9, 25 with me. And we're going to start to unpack this, okay? It says, no one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Two events are named here, first off, which make these numbers significant. The first event is pretty clear cut. It is issuing the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And then the ending point is going to be after 69 weeks, the anointed one, in Hebrew, anointed one is Messiah. That's going to be the ending point. So we've got a beginning point, we've got an ending point. And we've got a time frame. Seven sevens plus 62 sevens. Now, if those are seven sevens of years instead of sevens of days, then you've got 49 years for seven sevens. And then you've got another 62 sevens, which is 434 years, which add them together, you've got 483 years. Does that make sense? That's how they come across, how they come up with why seven weeks plus 62 weeks is 483 years. I hope that's clear, how that adds up. So we should ask the question, how do we know for sure it's years and not days? Let's say it was days. In fact, let's say all of, all of this in chapter nine is days of weeks, or weeks of days, not weeks of years. Then you need to look at what is gonna be accomplished in that amount of time. One of the things is the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. They did not build cities then like they do now. Now, I don't know, think for a moment, if, if all of Pipestone were to be wiped out and we were gonna rebuild Pipestone, is there a chance that we could do it in a year and a half? Because that's about 483 days is about a year and a half. Not quite, probably not even gonna get it done with all of our technology. Now, put it in the perspective, some of you who have seen the, the Temple Mount, see the size of the blocks, the rocks, that are being used, which are, you know, maybe six feet deep, 20 feet long, four feet high. They're using the, these, these foundational stones that are huge. It took an army of men years and years and years to rebuild just the temple, let alone the city walls and the city gates. In fact, if you look at John chapter two, verses 18 through 20, this is when Jesus is, is, Jesus is referring to how his body is going to be destroyed and how he's going to raise again from the dead after three days. But here was the interaction. It says, so the Jews replied to him, what sign of authority will you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered, 
destroy the sanctuary and I will raise it up in three days. He's speaking of his body there, we know that. But they didn't, and they said this, the sanctuary took 46 years to rebuild. And you're gonna raise it up in three days? You see, there's the mindset of the Hebrews. They know how long this stuff takes. So when it was said that the city is gonna be rebuilt, they knew that these were not weeks of days, these were weeks of years. The context of sevens would be understood as years. That's just one aspect to it. And y'all, this is where it gets really, really cool. <laughs> it ties into our theme for the year. Do you remember our theme for the year? We are to be conduits of hope. I, I really believe there's passages like this that can give us a lot of hope. So look at this. What you're about to learn, if you don't already know this, God's got a magnificent hope for us. Let's go back to Daniel 9, 25, once again. This is going to be the 69 years we're looking at. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, will be seven weeks, 62 weeks. You now see why we're saying 483 years. This passage, the passage, Daniel wrote this somewhere around 500 years before Jesus was born, okay? He wrote it about 500 years before Jesus was born. Now, if you remember from the past, I was talking about how when Daniel was given the prophecy of how Medo-Persia was going to come in and overtake Babylon, Remember that? And then Greece would take over and then Rome would take over. And there were a lot of critics who would say it was so accurate that this had to be written later on because it's so down to the point accurate. And those of us who trust in God, who is a all-knowing God, omniscient God, ever-present God, know that he knows the future. And he will sometimes share with us elements that we need to know. Now here's where it becomes undeniable. This was written 500 years before Christ. Take this into consideration. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in around the 1940s, if I'm remembering exactly right. And when they were found, and as they continue to decipher them and go through, one of the things that shows up is we've got remnants of the book of Daniel from almost 200 years before Jesus was born. So in our possession, in the museums, there is a written document telling, telling us Daniel in remnant form. Now in a more full form, we have remnants from about 125 BCE, okay? So about 125 years before Jesus comes on the scene, we've got more complete documents of it. So here's the thing. The critics cannot argue that because we have got it written and documented from that time frame. So here we have it. It was written around 500 years before. And here's what we've got that we know from history, not just from scripture, but from history, we have got points that we know when this decree went out to rebuild Jerusalem. Scripturally speaking, we find it in Nehemiah 1, 1 through 4, and then 2, 1 through 8. So I do want to read that. Listen to it. It says, During the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa. Now, this is, this is Nehemiah. We're not, this isn't Daniel. It says, Han and I, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah. And I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. And they said to me, The remnant in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned down. So Jerusalem is in rubble. 
When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before God of heaven. Okay, then chapter two. During the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had never been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why are you sad when you're not sick? This is nothing but depression. I was overwhelmed with fear and I replied to the king, may the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king asked me, what is your request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant was found, has found favor with you, send me to Judah, to the city where my ancestors are buried, so that I might rebuild it. And the king with the queen seated beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you return? So I gave him a definite time and it pleased the king to send me. I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters written to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates River so that they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. And let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to rebuild the gates of the temple's fortress, the city wall, and the home where I live. And the king granted my request, for I was graciously strengthened by my God. So King Artaxerxes says, go, rebuild the city. Here are the documents for you to go and do so. The month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, it says. Now historians tell us Artaxerxes became king in 465 BC. And that he died in, uh, he died in uh, 425 BC. So the 20th year would have been 445 BC. Month of Nisan, 445 BC. This goes out. Rebuild Jerusalem. That appears to be the most probable date from the beginning. There are, there are a couple other considerations. Some go to Ezra and look at, uh, at Cyrus as given a decree to go and rebuild the temple. But the key here is the decree is to rebuild Jerusalem, not just the temple. And here we've got the, the city included with it. So this is probably the most likely. Now I'm just going to jump to the chase. 483 years after Artaxerxes commands the rebuilding of the city, uh, one thing you need to take, in, take into consideration is Hebrew did not have a 365 day year. They had a 360 day year. Okay, so there's a lot of different scholars that have calculated out, okay, 483 years time, times this 360 days, 173,880 days, works out to be April of 32 AD. Now, those calculations, uh, like I said, have been done by a lot of, a lot of guys. One of them, Elva McLean, has a book written, uh, he, was, uh, he was the uh, president of Grace Bible College uh, in Indiana, and it's called Daniel's Prophecy. I've got it up there in the corner, but Daniel's Prophecy of the 70 Weeks. Now here's what I wanna just say, is that I cannot tell you that I know for sure, that I know, that I know, that I know, that this is exactly the intention with those days and figuring it out to those days. In fact, in my own personal mind, I'm thinking, okay, if you add those, day, if you add 483 years to that, and we get to the life of Christ, for me, I'm going. That's good. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty specific. I mean, the guy was around for 33 years, and in, a, in, in, in thousands of years, here's this prophecy that says, "Hey, you're gonna have the Messiah, and it's in his lifetime." That's pretty cool. Now, what Elva McLean and a lot of these other guys say, and it could be the the actual thing. They say this, if you take day one of Nisan of, of 445 and you add in the 1,730, uh, 173, 880 days, works out to be April 32 of AD, 
which was when Jesus was walking into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and they were saying, the King of the Jews. He's being proclaimed as the King. That's what they're saying. Now, if that's accurate, I'm going, wow. Guys, that's really, really cool. That's incredible. But again, for me, hey, for me, I'm okay even just saying, we're at Christ. And Jesus said, I'm him. I'm the Messiah. The numbers work out. And we've got copies of copies from 125 years before he was born. Come on. Doesn't that kind of, doesn't that kind of give you a little bit of a, a thrill to see the prophecy fulfilled like that, the, the accuracy of it? It gives me just incredible encouragement. When we talk about this scripture and we, and we wonder, is it accurate? Can we trust it? Is it trustworthy? There are elements like this. There's a whole lot more other ones in there. But when you've got elements like this, it just speaks to me. Here it is. God's got a plan. He's got this under control. He knew before the foundations of the world that there was going to be a lamb that was slain, and his name is Jesus. And the time frame would be this time frame. Now, I hope that you are saying, eh, I'm not quite sure about that. I'm going to go home and check it out. I encourage you, go and dig in. Study this stuff. Check out these things. And like I said, there are some other thoughts. One other thought is the fact that 490 years just meant a long time into the future. Could be possible because when Jesus said, no, don't just forgive him seven times, forgive him 70 times seven, which is 490. Jesus wasn't saying, forgive him 490 times, but on the 491st time, feel free to smack him. That's not what he was saying. He was saying just, it just goes on, right? So that is a possibility. But I personally land on the fact that this is so accurate. When you look at the fact that we've got the decree and we know that time frame. And then we've got Jesus Christ who says, I'm the Messiah and I'm here. And the time frame is right. That speaks to me about the truth and the reliability of the word of God. That's cool stuff. Before the foundations of the world, God had a plan to redeem. This passage is one of the strong evidences that God's word is divinely inspired. Right? Meaning, it wasn't just guys that made this up. It wasn't just Daniel trying to come up with some creative way to put something down to confuse people. Gabriel came before Daniel, and Gabriel spoke, and Daniel recorded it. And it was protected. That's another aspect. This was protected for you and I to have today by the Holy Spirit. And believe me, there have been nations who have tried to wipe this Bible off the face of the earth. And Antiochus Epiphanes was one of them. We talked about him, right? More, most recently, the Nazis. You know, let's get rid of the scriptures. Let's destroy it. Let's destroy anything that the Jewish people would hold on to. So when I think about threats of war, threats of disease, it speaks to my soul to know that I am anchored in the truth of God. I'm anchored in Christ who didn't turn on the news and go, oh, there's a coronavirus. What are we going to do? He didn't do that. Yeah, we've got to be wise. Yeah, we've got to be smart. Yeah, please wash your hands. Please don't be a close talker. That's just good advice all the time, by the way. But we're anchored in the truth. Worship team, come on up. Originally, like I said, my plan was going to be to uh, preach on the 70th week today, but there's just too much here. And uh, for next week, I want to give a little bit of time to look at what is the 70th week and what are the possibilities there. So I pray that God will, will inspire you through it, um, encourage you through it, give you hope, and just, just boost your trust in him. He knows what's going on. Amen? Father God, I thank you. I thank you for being a God who cares, that you 
didn't create and then leave. You don't see us from a distance. You see us up close. You know us intimately. You know, you know our lives inside and outside. You know our hearts inside and outside. And you've got plans. Plans to bring you glory. And Father, I thank you that, that we get to look forward to the next part when Jesus will return again. As he promised, as you see me go, he's going to return. And that there's an eternity waiting for us. Lord, help our hearts to be tender to you and to hear your truth. In your name I pray. By the power of Jesus Christ and the blood that purifies us, we pray. Amen.
start the morning. I love that. Uh, what a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against the name of Jesus. So as you greet each other this morning, maybe just say hi. <laughs> It's your 